things. And if drones are here and they're the only game in town, absolutely we're going to be using them. So. Dunleavy. He's an expert on drones and he's going to explain some things to us because not only are people talking about airborne drones nowadays, but they're talking about the drones that are in the Black Sea if, and nobody really knows if they're there. And you told me they're still called drones? Well, they are still called drones and they, they go even further than unmanned aircraft systems that are referred to as drones or the seaborne drones uh, that, that are submersible or just ride the surface. You've got landborne drones, satellites themselves also count as unmanned aircraft systems or drones. So uh, it, it is in many terms an all encompassing term, and sometimes it's a pejorative term, but yes, you could use the term drone for submersibles or just waterborne unmanned vehicles. When did drones become a thing? Because this seems to me like the first conflict where it's really relevant. And when I say this conflict, I'm talking about the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Drones, or they were called drones, probably the term was originated in the uh, in, in World War II. And uh, we, were, we were flying them for target, uh, aerial target practice. Um, we've had them since Vietnam. I would say that you first saw unmanned aircraft in the, the large and the medium altitude long endurance sense in the Yom Kippur War when they were flying alongside manned fighter aircraft. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, the small UAS, I think, are coming really to the forefront now. So this is the first conflict where you've got a one nation state with a large standing regular army fighting against another uh, large uh, relatively large nation state with a, a regular army, one of which is, is a major nuclear power. And this is the first time you've got the large unmanned aircraft systems and most importantly, or at least uh, what we see most and is reported on mostly are the, the uses of the small unmanned aircraft systems. And we hadn't seen that before in a conflict such as this. So this, this really would be the first time that you've seen small drones used in, in such a fashion and at such scale. And, and when you're talking about the small drones, are you talking about the, what, the Shahid 136 drones that the people in Ukraine say they're mopeds because they can hear them coming and it sounds just like a little scooter? Yeah, those would definitely still qualify as the small UAS, maybe maybe group two UAS, depending on how much they weigh. And I would I would say that that the, the noise or the sound of those drones are it's deliberate because it can have a psychological impact on a, on a populace. So, you know, they'll hear the drone coming. So maybe it's a warning, but it's also a reminder uh, that that they're there in the air. And, and then you hear the explosion. So it's a reminder of what these drones are capable of. You know, we've got our unmanned aircraft systems that we're sending to Ukraine. Uh, those definitely qualify as drones and they're far more advanced than the Shahed's. But the Shahed's are, are definitely uh, unmanned aircraft systems that cannot be underestimated and, and, and qualify as small unmanned aircraft systems. Well, the other thing is, you know, are they drones and uh, technically, those are also loitering munitions. So a, a different that. way to say it. You know, you've got artillery shells or artillery pieces like the howitzers are being brought to the forefront of, of wars that we haven't seen since World War I or when, when artillery was so prevalent in positional warfare. Uh, and then you've got the munitions that go along with them that, you know, they're not guided. Your accuracy when you uh, fire a an artillery piece is not going to be nearly as accurate as these, I would call them, they're basically like silver bullets, what these loitering munitions are, because they're, they're not unguided munitions. They have sensors that can give a live feedback to an operator, and they can control it in basically real time. And, and, and they can fly it low and not get detected by any kind of radar. And then they can, they can put it on target with much more uh, precision accuracy than you would with a with an artillery piece, but an artillery shell is still going to be a lot less expensive. Question, how are drones being used in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? Well, in a very novel way, and, and in many ways, it's sad to say how 
uh, how how well they are being used. But uh, we're we're seeing that the Ukrainians and the Russians both are learning from how they're being used. Um, you know, as as they go and as they both go. But at first, you saw that they were using a lot of large UAS, and the, the Ukrainian army was was galvanized by the the Turkish drone that they were purchasing called the Bayraktar, and uh, it was a very cost effective aircraft for them. And you could see that the Russians were adapting in uh, you know not real time, but in war time, and were able to. Uh, essentially deny airspace for aircraft that were that large and that were flying that high and that slowly. Now you're seeing the the small UAS being used for what's called ISR or intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. And they're they're able to see where the, the troops are. And you'd even actually see this before Russia invaded. You saw a lot of this use in the in the Crimea, where they're they're flying the small delta styrofoam quads or well styrofoam Delta uh, shaped aircraft and and sometimes the the quads as well, okay, so all that's... relatively yeah, delta. so just just a flying wing uh, and relatively small, relatively inexpensive, but still able to detect where the enemy forces are. And if it gets shot down, you don't really care because they're so cheap, they're basically attritable. Being able to hear the drone has a psychological effect. And mm -hmm. in Ukraine, they're reluctant to shoot down some of the Iranian ones because they don't do too much damage and they can't afford to waste some of their bigger firepower on these things. Is that also factored in to the whole drone thing? Yeah, so Thucydides said that war is not so much a matter of weapons as of money. If you're seeing these aircraft, which the unmanned aircraft, the Shahed's, are not as precise or as accurate, then why why expend ammunition, which ultimately costs money to deter or to counter or, or deny those the small unmanned aircraft? So if they're so inaccurate that they're not going to get anything, you know, we can live with the 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 reminder that people are firing Shahed's at us, or at least this is what the Ukrainians might be thinking in terms of we need to make sure that we're uh, as cost effective as we can in our war effort. They don't necessarily need to shoot them all down because a lot of them are, are missing by a mile. And I liken it to the the Blitz and the revenge weapons that uh, the Wehrmacht had in World War II. The, the V2s oftentimes were so inaccurate when the Germans were firing at London that it didn't matter that they missed because the, the, the rockets were weren't there necessarily to be extremely accurate. They were just there to be that that nuisance that in many ways they were but uh i think that uh ultimately that they were cost ineffective so why spend the money to take down the shot heads when they're already such a small target and they're gonna miss as long as they're not as accurate as the iranians or the russians would want them to be then the ukrainians aren't going to be as in in deep trouble but remember remember the russians are absolutely adapting as they go and they, they cannot, these, these munitions, these loitering munitions cannot be underestimated. Are there any drones that do their job completely automatically? I'd like to know a little bit about the ethics of programming. Are we getting to a point where we're just sending these drones out and letting them do what they're programmed to do, regardless of what's in their way? That's a great question. That's a very important one that all militaries across the world are asking themselves. I am not representing any company in particular today. I'm just a, a UAS subject matter expert. And I would yeah. mention though that I created and instruct the unmanned aircraft systems ethics class at the University of North Dakota. And I do not represent the University of North Dakota in this discussion, but one of the things that I found fascinating in the creation of that class is that the United States in particular, while we have artificial intelligence capabilities, and, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about a drone that flies itself, the autonomy that is based on an artificial intelligence. We have not used these capabilities against a uh, another nation state in a major conflict. If we did that, it's hard to put that toothpaste back in the tube. We, now, we cannot say for certain that the Russians or the Iranians or whomever that is fighting against the Ukraine, uh, that they are using aircraft that are fully autonomous. Because if they do, then they know that all bets are off and you can't put that genie back in the bottle either. 
that is when we know that we don't have to have the academic debate any further about whether we use artificial intelligence on these aircraft. So we use AI in the, in the data processing. Captured imagery is sent through an artificial intelligence to help create actionable intelligence or actual intelligence. Um, the drones right now is a very important uh, theme that you'll hopefully see across uh, all of the belligerents writ large is that we, we are not using aircraft that are flying themselves, despite the fact that in many cases, these are aircraft that could fly themselves. To me, it's almost like a AI deterrent, kind of an echo of the Cold War, like a nuclear thing. Is, has there been research done in the, with parallels like that? Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's game theory and you think of it as the scorpion and the frog. And so you just hope that it's not in somebody's nature, like it would be in the scorpion's nature to, to strike somebody with this weapon because they've got it. Hopefully we have uh, the understanding of mutually assured destruction. If all of a sudden we unleash, unleash these artificial intelligence on each other, um, similarly to how in the cold war, you know, it, uh, we had that, uh, we had the, the period of detente and we had the, the period of massive retaliation and then everybody understood there was mutually assured destruction that we just cannot use these weapons. Um, cause... The Ukrainians have had to be very agile in adapting to the situation and they've come up with some really quick solutions in the field. I've seen reports of people modifying hobby drones uh, to do reconnaissance and drones having machine guns attached to them. Are you learning lessons from the conflict? Yes. Uh, one thing I'm I'm thinking is not as effective is is the actual uh, strapping of a machine gun to a drone right yet. I think that the explosives are probably uh, a more effective uh, weapon. But uh, one thing that you're seeing is the the use of unmanned aircraft systems in tandem. Uh, with each other or in concert with several as a swarm. One thing that the Ukrainians did was uh, they, they put one aircraft in the air that's just got a sensor and it's hovering and it is basically the spotter. And it's a quadcopter that can, you know, stay in the air, very stable. Uh, and it's it's got a sensor that can tell the, the operator where the aircraft is and where the sensor is pointing. And then they put a hobby aircraft in the air with a shape charge. And this aircraft is telling this aircraft where to go. And it's it can zoom in if it just sees a silhouette. So uh, I, I would hope that they know and they have good enough ground intelligence to to see that whoever they're sending that uh, quadcopter after, it would be like a racing quad with a first person view. They're very fast. Uh, they're very agile. They have low latency so that the the pilot is able to basically control it. And uh, you would hope that that first aircraft that goes in the air gives that ground team enough intelligence to, to make sure that they're, uh, they're about to send that race quad after someone who's actually a, a combatant of theirs uh, against them. And that is still a situation where the, the pilot, the operator has control with the information they're getting. Correct. So you're gonna have to most likely have two pilots. So one pilot who's flying that first aircraft and, and you can see this in uh, in commercial operations. So we'll say that that first aircraft is doing aerial cinematography so that you can get really good views of, of that second aircraft as it does you know, work in the commercial sector. So it's something we're learning. Uh, and, and we're also learning that if you wanna do something like that, if you wanna you know, do it in a, in, a, in a way that isn't part of war and still show that drones have value and drones are here for good, you're going to still need two pilots, at least for a good period of time, per the regulations. What do you notice that maybe someone else wouldn't notice about when they're reporting on drone strikes? Well, what I see, and I would say this affectionately, is usually you can kind of tell in, in which direction whatever news channel slants by the way in which they report on unmanned aircraft systems. I see a lot of the vernacular get either conflated or or misused. So for example, I'll hear uh, anchors will say unmanned drones, where you could either just say drones or you could say unmanned aircraft. Uh, we'll see uh, different ways in which we'll describe how they're used or the, they just won't pick up a story that potentially had some notability. And but one thing that is, I think, good is that we're starting to see more and more in the commercial sector, 
reporting on drones in general and showing that drones are, are also a force for good, um, in uh, addition to being not just a uh, force multiplier for, for militaries, but a force unto themselves. So, uh, you know, that's some, that's some rhetoric that we have to, uh, you know, make sure that we're getting across correctly in the commercial sector is that these are also tools for societal good. And, you know, this comes out in the ethics class as well. And in many ways, you know, we'll see on uh, some of the news sources that, you know, we're the only ones that are, are using unmanned aircraft systems at, at such advanced levels. Well, we don't necessarily want it to be a fair fight against our adversaries. And if drones are here and they're the only game in town, absolutely, we're going to be using them. So uh, we're going to be using them to uh, protect democracy and we're going to be using them to advance American industry or, or Western industry in general. That's what I'd like to see mostly when, when, uh, when I'm looking at the news. And sometimes I don't see that. Sometimes I do see that. In general, we're seeing more and, and we're starting to see people who report on unmanned aircraft systems to get a little bit more savvy in, in the language that they use. You've mentioned the ethics class you teach at the University of North Dakota. They have a really well-known aviation program. Is that the connection with the drones? And are drone pilots like airplane pilots? Uh, fantastic question. I would preface that again with saying that I'm not representing the University of North Dakota on this one. Yes, they have perhaps the, the most well-known or the best manned aviation school in the world. They do have the world's largest manned aircraft training fleet perhaps the, the world's largest training fleet of unmanned aircraft systems. The, the big question I think you'll see across all uh, aircrafts, manned aircraft uh, universities that also have unmanned aircraft systems programs is whether you would require drone pilots to have a, a private pilot certificate or a manned aircraft certificate. So are manned aircraft pilots like unmanned aircraft pilots in many ways, yes, because the airspace is the same. You have to have a very good understanding of airspace. You have to have a very good understanding of aerodynamics and I would say technology in general. But it's it's very different from the ground uh, flying an, an aircraft where you can have completely reversed spatial orientation. In, in many ways, there are uh, serious differences that need to be considered and, and they're they're both equally uh, difficult, I would say. It's it's very difficult to fly manned aircraft. Uh, it's very complex and difficult to fly unmanned aircraft. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is all aviation. So it needs to be treated as such. Uh, and I'd say that the University of North Dakota does an extremely good job uh, of doing that. What is your class listed under? Is it an elective for aviation? Is it in ethics? Is it in political science? Who can all take it's, your class? It's ethics. So it's, it's under the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, but we we had a lot of the aviation students were were taking the class to, to put together. Uh, it was the first of its kind in in the United States. It's very so, important to show that unmanned aircraft systems are are also tools for for good, and that you know from a deontological standpoint, from a utilitarian standpoint, uh, as long as you don't have some nefarious actor uh, go out and and use unmanned aircraft systems in the commercial sector for ill and give a bad name to everybody then you should see that public perception of unmanned aircraft systems are going to continue to, to rise. When I ask you to do this interview, one of the things in the back of my mind is drones are mentioned so much and the entire conflict since February 24th, 2022, there have been these David versus Goliath stories. And there's a couple dealing with drones, one in March, there was a woman that supposedly took down a, a drone with a jar of tomatoes. There are pictures of people using hunting rifles to try to take down the lower flying drones. And what advice would you offer a civilian if they are close to an enemy drone? Without any liability, of course, Matt. First off, it's, it's really charming uh, to, to see some of these stories come out with the, the David being Ukraine and Russia being Goliath. And you see, you know, that, that is almost literally a, a slingshot of the, the lady throwing a can of tomatoes and, and taking down an, um, a Russian drone. So, and, and I saw that reported on Drone DJ. I love those guys. They do great drone work for, for the news aggregation. If I had advice for 
uh, people who see an unmanned aircraft. While that's that's a charming story, and it's it's good for the the Ukrainians to see that everyone is going to do their part and they're putting up a stiff resistance. I would I would suggest that uh, if <laughs> if you're not a professional counter UAS combatant, then uh, you might want to not be uh, in harm's way. We don't know how fast the Russians are adapting their unmanned aircraft systems. We do not know uh, truly what the capabilities are right now of those unmanned aircraft. And my warning is that these things are the real deal. And they do what you expect that they can do. And if all they need to do is to see your silhouette. A lot of these unmanned aircraft have sensors already that are autonomously keeping them from running into obstacles that are static. So you don't know if the artificial intelligence is on board and it's being used in a way that humans can't in the loop take it away. You don't know if uh, a sensor is on there that isn't just to keep it away from static objects, but to draw it towards objects that are in motion. So a motion sensor. Um, and then you've got these drones that could be indiscriminately uh, targeting whatever they see that moves. You don't know how brutal the operator, you don't know the rules of engagement, uh, what the orders are of, of whoever is, is flying the aircraft, what, they're, what orders they're under. I would, my thought is that if you see a drone and you suspect that it is the enemy's and you're not necessarily uh, a combatant, that you should probably take cover. Again, I mean, it's, it's a really charming story, but uh, these, these are, they are obsolete every other month, the, the drones that they would have seen. So my advice is to, um, is to protect yourselves. Matt Dunleavy, drone expert. Thank you very, very much. No problem. Thank you so much.